Okay, so we've had burlesque dancers. We've had boy burlesque dancers. I asked this guy to strip. He said no. I asked him again. He said no. And then he showed up with his head shaved. So technically, Kevin Vilbig did take something off for us. Back once again with some spoken word, Mr. Kevin Vilbig. I spent Christmas with my family in Amarillo. Christmas Eve, white elephant. We brought some last minute gifts at a truck stop on the way into town. I think it was one of those fuzzy posters with included markers. It was just something to have something, a gift meant for a long haul trucker to bring home to his kid on his birthday when he only gets to see him six weeks out of the year. Talk about awkward. The socially retarded Megan, meeting a double dozen of my extended family in a whirlwind of greetings and oh God help me, looks of panic and terror from her to me. It was my family's huge drunken Irish Christmas feast. When the night ended, my grandmother offered us some space to crash on the floor. I was ready for some sleep, but Megan would have none of it. I'm significantly more intrepid. She's a Taurus, so even one night of discomfort would kind of blow her mind sometimes. She pulled me aside after my grandmother had already laid out some cushions on the floor. We aren't sleeping here. We're driving home tonight. The roads were closed. We stayed up talking until sunrise, Christmas Day. Snow had fallen overnight. I-40 was there, somewhere, underneath nearly a foot of ice. Some sections of the frozen surface had already been worn down by the successive friction of long haul truckers and intrepid holiday travelers. Our first attempt to leave the Texas panhandle was stymied by roadblocks, but after a quick breakfast at some chain diner, I think it was a Waffle House, we found the roadblocks moved aside. The roads were clear. It was 6 a.m. The pre-dawn light had just begun to filter over the horizon. It was slow driving, 30 miles an hour the whole way. She peered out the passenger window of my red Ford pickup truck with a blank look on her face. There was no need to communicate emotion at that point. I was also seeing the stunning visions of the world after a true winter storm. The trees glittered, winter twigs encased in glass. Frozen fog hung in windless valleys after the passing of the storm. Snowmen wearing discarded bits of clothing dotted the side of the road, leftovers from truckers and families' attempts to keep busy while the great blizzard of 06 shut down the arteries of transport for a single night. The warmth from the truck's engine could only barely cut the chill, leaving us wearing sweaters while blasting the heat on Max. We made great time, considering. The usual three-hour drive took us, about, took us about six hours. And around noon, we returned to our low-slung, stuccoed cinder block apartment building. Snow had coated Albuquerque in a thick dusting of white powder. My first impulse was to get inside and get the underfloor heater cranked to warm our chilly domicile. Hers was to pack on more clothes and get out into the snow. She was a sculptor, and snow has always been her chosen medium. She had a crazed look in her eyes, wide-eyed and open only to see her vision arise from the yard. She dumped out a blue bin all over our bed. We shared a futon in the living room as the bedroom had been converted into an aviary for her birds. She had 20 or so. The box became her snow shovel. Before it contained a smattering of art supplies, pencils, paper, chalks, and who knows what else. But once the madness overtook her, it became for a singular purpose, collecting snow into discreet piles in our yard. As the hours passed, the piles began to transform into the arches of a sea serpent, complete with triangular scales rising from the center of its back. The head and tail were the final pieces to coalesce into the real world out of her vision. 
Our neighbor, Deb, who's back here in the back in the audience right here, she came today kind of serendipitously, was uh, drawn into Megan's frenzy and assisted in the snow collection process. And as Megan turned to the details of her piece, Deb began to build a snow fortress with the remaining snow. It turned into a four-foot circular tower, ruined by the passing dragon. At the end of the day, as the sun fell, there was a dragon in our yard, with bulbous eyes, flaring nostrils, and a triforked tail. He swam through our yard, coiling underneath the surface. It looked like it was about to go swimming down the street. The next day, as the sun shone, the thin layer of snow left in the yard had melted, and the white dragon rose from the amber of dead grass. Cars were stopping as people flashed pictures. At the end of that day, we got a knock on our door. We both looked at each other, surprised. That almost never happened. I answered. It was a couple, a blonde woman in her 50s, and an older Indian or Pakistani man. They gave her a handful of figs with a look of awe in their eyes. They almost wanted to do more. It seemed like the man was about to reach for his wallet to throw everything he had at her. But Megan thanked them in clipped phrases, and they quickly turned away, walking as if they were in a daze. Maybe they were just drunk. 